Welcome colleagues and friends to the Psychological Humanities and Ethics Lecture Series, where we hope to think more humanely and practice more ethically as we face the other. I'm Muki Manalili, and I'll be your host tonight with our special guest, Dr. Sue Grant. Thank you for joining us today, Sue. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks for creating this interesting, important lecture series. Sue is a faculty and supervisor at NYU's postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. She's a faculty for the trauma program at the National Institute of, for the Psychotherapies, a faculty at the Mitchell Center for Relational Studies, a visiting scholar at the Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California, and a fellow and a beloved mentor in the psychology and the other community. And as you can see, amidst all of the other several important and wonderful roles that she has, she is also a very deep thinker and has written important books and journal articles, including The Reproduction of Evil, A Clinical and Cultural Perspective. She is in private practice in New York City and Teaneck, New Jersey, and her research dives into important topics of clinical culture and repetitions of violence. Tonight, we'll be dialoguing about restorative justice, perpetrator memories, and transgenerational trauma. Indeed, Sue notes that restorative justice is a healing project, a humanizing dialogue between perpetrators and victims, offering radical listening to the wounded this dialogue can awaken reflectivity and reparative guilt in the perpetrator. These practices can disrupt our repetitive cycles of violence and vengeance. Nonetheless, US culture clings to harsh shame-inducing models of crime and punishment that invite the renewal of this violence. So why don't we embrace a more healing model, she asks. In this lecture, will suggest that the US colonial label history yielded a particular forgotten form of intergenerational transmission, a fusion of victim perpetrator states that we know as white guilt. So without further ado, Sue, would you mind sharing a bit more on this framework for our audience as we begin? Sure, and I just wanna say that um, the thoughts that I'm sharing today are, um, both something that I thought about forever and also newly formulating. And there may be gaps in, uh, gaps in the links between uh, some of the history and some of the thinking that I'm doing psychoanalytically. And I kind of wish that I could see all your faces and hear all your voices because the most um, helpful thing about thinking about these things is dialogue. <clears throat> but for now, I'm gonna talk, wind up talking for about 20 minutes and I think, Amuki, I'm so glad to be in a conversation with you and you've got a lot to add. And then we're gonna be taking questions and I will try to be as related as possible given that I can't see you. Um, so I just want to um, give a broad stroke and then get into some more depth and detail about the questions I'm, that have been uh, troubling me and on my mind that for one thing, we all just witnessed the siege at the Capitol. And we've been struck by many things, of course, which are not news, but were particularly shocking, which was the simultaneity of the white entitlement towards this kind of aggression. The idea that they never expected to be uh, arrested, that they never expected to uh, face um, police, uh, guns, and they didn't feel like they needed to hide their faces at all. Why hide your faces? This is something to be proud of. Nothing's going to happen to them. And simultaneously, there is this peculiar puzzle of white grievance that to most of us, it's rather clear that although there are many layers of relative privilege in our culture around class and gender and all kinds of other variables, that whiteness is dominant and whiteness has the privilege. And um, it's so clear uh, that white Christian nationalism 
it has tremendous power in this country. So what's this raging wound of um, this outrage uh, and sense of persecution? Now, obviously it's been formulated quite accurately in terms of um, the risk of losing privilege, that there's a big demographic change happening and coming and that the rage and the deprivation and the outrage is coming from that. And I absolutely agree with that. But I think that we can deepen some of these questions and by thinking about uh, an intersection of psychoanalytic um, framing of transgenerational transmission, about thinking about very early colonial history and um, thinking in this interdisciplinary way. So the other thing that's linked to this puzzle for me is the question that has been fortunately receiving more attention, which is the question of reparations. Uh, but not just, um, you know, we have many ideas that are becoming very creative about the nature of reparations. What is this resistance to reparations? And in general, why is it so hard for us to embrace in, uh, throughout our culture a restorative justice model when we um, transgress against the other? What is, why do we have a culture that is so deeply uh, attached to a really bestial, cruel, humiliating, violent criminal justice system? And why is it so rare? I mean, at pr that practices are happening in very small doses and not just in prisons, there are these wonderful projects, but in multiple venues like schools and organizations where there is a wound and a wounded and that there has been an effort not to frame this so much as crime and punishment, but as repair and or obligation to make repair. So this is one of my puzzles. Why is this, uh, you know, when I watch, for example, uh, videos of programs that work with really truly violent uh, convicted criminals who are in prison and see the kinds of work that's being done around restorative justice and not only obviously the effect on the injured or family of the injured, but the actual blossoming of reparative remorse in the person who has perpetrated so that there's actual deep um, opening of humanization inside someone who previously was deadened to empathy. And if this is possible, why are we supporting this? So um, what I wanna do first is talk a little bit about the way I think of uh, transgenerational transmission and the interiority and external manifestation of victim and perpetrator states. So I think the most important thing for me to convey, and this is, if you're a psychoanalyst, it's very familiar to you. If you're, if it, if you're not, uh, perhaps you have thought about this this way or not, that we, I, we, most of us no longer think about having a kind of singular self or a self where there's a true self and a false self, right? So in the past, we would think about um, somebody who did something really hurtful who otherwise seemed like a very nice person and think, ah, that's them real self. That's who they really are. The rest is a performative surface. What's developed, which I think is much richer, is a sense that we all have multiple self states in us and that uh, no matter how benign our his personal history is, that we have these different states and that they exist in different states relative to dissociation and fragmentation. That is, they're in more or less ready conversation with each other, more or less capacity for awareness. And if we think about it, this is very familiar to all of us. You have different relationships in which you show different parts of yourself. So when it comes to trauma, I, you know, I first started to study trauma um, through a 
the more narrow lens of family history. And then the transgenerational look at trauma moves backwards into further generations, grandparents, great grandparents, and their exposure to what we might call collective traumas in which they've had their own personal difficulty. In, when someone's been traumatized in either of these kinds of ways or in both, what's left, I'm sorry, um, boy, sorry, it's getting a cold. Um, what's left in our interior is traces of the perpetrator, victim states, and traces of bystanders. Now, I would say, I don't know, for example, if there's anything like this, let's say you're caught in an earthquake. I suppose it's possible, but I'm talking about malignant trauma. I'm talking about trauma at the hands of a human being or a, a human collective that should be kind and caring and is violating. Uh, those basic premises that should hold between human beings. So we all generally, we carry the traces of these things. We don't just have victim states or perpetrator states. Any one of those can become salient at different times. The other thing that, that happens is my sister-in-law is trying to reach me. And for some reason I can't, uh, let me shut this off. I have to hide it under a pillow or something. Um, these states are manifest in your internal world. So for example, um, a, a very lovely human being can be tortured by an internal perpetrator who's attacking them all the time, putting them down, making them worthless, nothing to do with any good. Uh, you deserved it, it was your fault, right? The other thing is that there are lots of modes in which we, to escape from the impossibility of holding these things inside is that we externalize them, right? So we might um, it, it affiliate with somebody who's abusive and be unable to get away. So the perpetrator is projected there, right? Or um, for people who, let's say, uh, the shame and the mortification of the victim state is so intolerable that what they do, and I think we just saw this with our last president, is they um, reproduce, evoke and reproduce states of abject dependency and need and deprivation in the other or in whole groups of others. And then instead of being kind towards them, they attack them, they deprive them, they slander them and relocate the shame and mortification outwards so that the uh, self doesn't need to experience it. So, and, and these, um, these operations are operating through collectives. They're operating through politics. They're operating through all of our policies, right? That we keep reconstructing a, uh, an abject deprived um, class of persons in whom we store our own abjection and our own horror of interdependency and need and uh, in which we store our hate and we store our hatred of our own victim self, right? Because the victim self carries a lot of self-hatred and self-blame. So the other thing that's important, and I'm not a Kleinian per se, but I think that uh, some of her basic principles are, uh, you can't think politics and culture without thinking about this particular mode of being, which is that um, it's called the paranoid schizoid mode, which most people are familiar with. And the operations of the paranoid schizoid mode are a perpetual system in which the world is divided into good and bad in extremes. The self um, needs to, uh, to own and uh, consume all goodness, keep all badness out. The problem is that it's a perpetual movement system. And if the badness is out, then there's a danger of it getting in. And if you push it out again, then you can feel good for a minute, but there, you're in a threatening world that it's gonna get in, 
So <clears throat> the systems around perpetrator and victim states are fluid motion systems. The other thing is that that's really, really important is that for many, many people, both of these positions are intolerable um, with the exception maybe of our former president and some other people we can think of. Uh, these states are intolerable because the victim state is flooding with shame and terror, right? The perpetrator state, it means that the victim state's being terrorized and all over again, and it's evil. So it can't own goodness. The other thing that, that's another part of these operations is that the perpetrator parts, unless the person is a complete psychopath, the perpetrator parts have a primal form of guilt that's not helpful. It's a kind of obsessional looping or it turns into terror of being attacked. So for example, the best example I can always think of is that during slavery, white masters were raping their female slaves. But the narrative was that black slaves were going to rape the white mistress. And that's, a for, that's one way of thinking about this persecutory guilt, this primal form of guilt. It's like a terror, a primal terror of like medieval, retro, medieval forms of torture. And usually, and the guilt that is inspiring that terror is unconscious. So it's not useful at all. Uh, it's just constantly arousing a sense that, a vague sense that um, you did something that you deserve to be tortured for. Uh, so these processes um, for me are essential to understanding what goes on in any trauma heritage, whether it's transgenerational heritage from mass trauma and or child abuse. So where do I wanna go from here? Uh, one of the things that I'm exploring, um, and Mookie, give me a wave when I've got to 20 minutes or something, okay? Um, because I really want to hear questions. One of the things that I've been very, very interested in, as I said, is white grievance and the insistence on this bestial cruelty of punishment, um, generally directed towards black and brown people. Uh, so um, why do we have such a uh, vicious system which locates perpetrators, many of whom have done very little, like uh, got caught uh, selling pot and they're in Rikers waiting for trial for a year, uh, some of whom have done some real terrible things. Um, why are we interested in a system that evokes uh, reparative concern and guilt and heightens empathy? If you read, James Gill Gilligan has a wonderful book, I can't remember the name of it right now, about prison, the prison system. What he writes about is the sense that the prison system is absolutely constructed to create peak sense of shame, which ignites peak aggression. And the experience internally is that you're, you're only seeking justice. In other words, anything that you do becomes legitimate because you are repairing the injustices to yourself. So by the way, I've never met a bully who didn't feel like a victim. A absolutely was a victim of some injustice and mistreatment and what rationalized everything they did if they were aware of it at all. So I, am, I also have been very, very interested in American history, the history of slavery, how this has gotten dissociated from white consciousness, why there has been no memorializing, no, no repair. Um, we're only now becoming uh, interested in creating zones of memory. Uh, so the other, th so I've been very interested in, in this history. And one of the things that started to, um, intrigue me is there's a lot being thought about and written about the point at which 
in our history, labor became raced uh, between black and white and then split uh, so that, um, you know, slavery becomes raced as African American and all of the uh, sequela of that for hundreds of years. So there's been a fair amount that's being written about this moment in time, but I wanted to go back before it. The, the moment in time that's being looked at is a moment in time at which the, um, the majority of labor was exported from England and the people who were sent to settle here, to lab they were sent to labor and die, were debtors, criminals, uh, the totally impoverished, vagrants, whoever they considered what they called waste people and worse. So the, uh, the British system of justice, haha, -ha, uh, at that time and for a long time before, makes our system of justice, uh, criminal justice, look mild. Um, for one thing, there were debtors prisoners, debtors prisons. You could be sent to debtors prison, which was incredibly uh, cruel. It doesn't begin to describe it. And in debtors prison, you're there for debtors being a debtor, right? You have no money. They charge you for your food. They charge you for your lodging in prison. If you want your leg chains removed, you have to buy it to have someone take your leg chains off. So somebody could go to prison for being in debt for what's the equivalent now of $5 and be there for 30 years uh, and often starving and dying <clears throat> well before that. Knowing that if somebody else in debtor's prison has wealth, and what does this sound like? He has wealth, they can buy food, they can buy comfort, they can buy uh, good treatment, right? Uh, and the rationale in England is, oh, and, and most of the crimes that people commit, so many of them, first of all, we don't, who knows if they actually committed them, but the crimes uh, often had death penalties for things that are shockingly banal, like minor thefts. So the uh, choice, I, don't, I can't quite get clear about whether the prisoner had anything to say about this, but it was a perfect system. And it was a system very much akin to convict labor after slavery, which uh, outlawed vagrancy in former slaves so that they could be shipped into convict labor and forced to labor for nothing just like they did in slavery. So the uh, construction of this early on was that uh, England was going to purge itself of the, all these unwanted people and colonize America with them. And America was not seen then as like this wonderful paradise. It was seen as this swamp, basically, that these peoples would be sent to basically penal colonies and uh, run by planters. The planters would buy these uh, subsequently called white laborers. They would be indentured for years and years. They had very few rights. And of course, the indentured time period could be broken, extended. But during this time, what was also incredible, of course, Africans were being kidnapped from Africa in even worse conditions, much worse conditions, into a world where they didn't speak the language. They were disrupted from their culture, their history, everything. But there's a period of time when labor is living together without these divisions and hatred. They're married, they're having relationships, they have alliances, they help each other, they work together, and there is not racial animosity. What starts to happen, and this is the juncture at which uh, people have been writing about the racing of labor in this country, is that um, the conditions under, and at this point, African laborers are in various conditions. They, they're slaves, but the uh, indentured servants are pretty much slaves. The, the differential is not huge. They can buy their freedom. They can be, have a future. Um, they're not slaves for life. 
Uh, they can hope that their children won't be slaves. The conditions of labor get worse and worse. And it's clear that the, far, the planter class is making this vast wealth off of this labor, um, which is becoming more and more brutal. And there is a moment called Bacon's Rebellion in which um, what's happening is, and you know, this makes me crazy, uh, some of the way that this is narrated in history, but what's happening is Bacon, who was a government official and a landowner, um, is angry at the local Indians and hates them and wants to, them all, all the local tribes exterminated. The governor uh, doesn't want them exterminated because he has certain tribes or allies. So Bacon gets started exterminating them anyway, and he enlists his laborers who are both European and African. These laborers start to see that they can unite and fight together against the government forces. And one of the odd things that Bacon does at the same time that he's exterminating the indigenous population is he starts pushing up against some of the way that this wealth is distributed, which may have sort of like, oh, right, we can fight this. What's really frightening to the power is that they're uniting and they're effective and they're getting that they can unite. It's after this that um, the planter class and the governing class realizes that they've got to divide and conquer. And all these laws are start to be passed, which have real life significance in terms of social status, um, empowerment for the future, whether it's, um, for example, uh, the indentured servants are allowed to have guns, which means that they can protect themselves. It means that they can go hunting. Um, and to me, this is a critical point, is what's happening at this juncture is that the, you can imagine these degraded, humiliated, starved peoples in these jails in Britain. This is the solution to maybe a death penalty. You can imagine the working conditions when they get here, right? And the abuse. So what are they going through as victims at that time? What is happening inside of them in terms of their victim perpetrator intersecting states, many of which, of course, you have to just shut down and become numb too because you're trying to survive. So at this juncture, when Bacon's Rebellion happens and um, labor becomes braced, Africans are more and more, uh, have more and more rights stolen from them and become more and more enslaved for, for life. Guns are put in the hands of people who have been tortured relentlessly. And how you can imagine how much soul deadening is going on, right? The planter class and the government intentionally not only divide them, but they inculcate this hatred of peoples that they've been living with, loving, helping, working together with, right? So um, to ameliorate your own sense of degradation and, and deprivation, you're being elevated now against these people and guns are put in your hands and they don't have any, right? So the, in a certain sense, the wish to kill the people who really did this to you is brilliantly manipulated to take that gun and kill the person who is now supposedly your enemy. And one of the things that uh, happens in transgenerational transmission that uh, Maurice Apri talks about, albeit in a rather cryptic way, um, is he talks about two things that are really worth thinking about. He talks about receiving an unconscious transgenerational errand from your forebears. That is some mission that you are supposed to carry out that is not stated or conscious, but some mission you are supposed to carry out on their behalf. The other thing he talks about <clears throat> 
<clears throat> is that often because of the layers of dissociation and splitting and flux between these states, right? All of which are intolerable and none of which can, can you pause and situate yourself in. And you're in a perpetual system that doesn't allow for communal compassion or holding or recognition. Uh, in fact, is stirring up the opposite. Is Maurice Apri talks about the fact that part of what happens is you become unable to locate clearly your real historic enemy. And what happens is that there is a, an enemy uh, in con the conscious parts of you and the unconscious parts of you that is deflected from your real historic enemy and inverted. So we have this history. We have what must be incredible, massive wounds. 50,000 British convicts were shipped to the US colonies at that time. And you can imagine. And the attitude towards poverty was completely criminalizing and completely like, you know, totally blamed for their own poverty and abandoned. So what are these states? What is this heritage? And then you have the um, fostering of these perpetrator states against an enemy who you can no longer see who did this to you and who was your enemy, your original enemy. Instead, you point it towards another location that's more abject than yourself, that you're told to hate and to other. And it becomes, um, and, and this, this mass trauma um, is, I think, part of what's sitting inside white grievance or has been um, perpetually inflamed over the centuries. So that, um, and, and part of the problem, and Reverend Barbara's really working on this, is to, that you can't have an effective labor resistance movement in this country because of this racialization and splitting. Uh, because uh, the power that runs the country has always known that this would really, and if, if there was an alliance with the indigenous population back then, instead of that kind of uh, othering, all of this would have been defeated very early. So there's, and because there's no history of an empathic holding repair or recognition or memorialization of any of this. In fact, it is completely, almost, it's dissociated. It's, you know, we have these wonderful origin myths to this country that are so not accurate. Um, if you, and I would highly recommend, I, I, I put up a couple of readings. Um, Batalora's reading book, small, brilliant, very readable book, Birth of a White Nation um, is it just so, what she does is she really tracks this history. She tracks the changes in the law. Um, she's not formulating it psychologically the way I am, um, but uh, you know, our criminal justice system uh, is a transgenerational replication and perpetuation actually softer a little softer, right? It never attends to the wounds of the victim. The, um, I'm just getting educated about restorative justice, but restorative justice, the premise of it, and one of the things I found a, like hit me like a ton of bricks when I started reading it, is that our criminal justice system views transgressions as crimes against the state, not against the victim. We've broken the law that the state owns. And now the state has the power and the state is attempting to repair the state, right? To through punishment um, and shaming and brutality. It is not a system that in any way focuses on the voice of the victim and allows the victim to tell their story and to articulate themselves how they want the perpetrator to make it right. Now, knowing that it can never be entirely made right, but the whole 
uh, structure of this is making it right and listening to the victim about what will help make this right. And it's all based on what does that particular victim need to be repaired. And obviously not every perpetrator is willing to do this um, and it's not that available. But for those who are willing, what it also revives is, and you can see this in some of these, um, I watched a, a documentary called The Prison Within. Um, which one of the things that you see and you don't see it overnight and it's the, it's the best portrait, you know, the best possible outcome is that what starts to happen to the perpetrator is where they deadened their inner victim memory and their inner victim self and deadened their empathy while they were perpetrating these violent crimes. There's something starts to happen where they're held accountable, but in a, humane, a human context. They're not objectified, they're not shamed, right? Um, but they are held accountable. What starts to happen is this um, inner uh, structure that they have uh, measured so carefully to avoid their victim memory becomes loosened. And as they, they are in a dialogue where they actually see the wound of a victim and they see the tears and they see the pain and they're asked to be accountable for repair, what starts to happen is not only does the perpetrator part of them start to loosen up empathy and guilt and recognition, but there's also the potential self-empathy and recognition for their own victimization. It's not the primary purpose of these restorative justice circles, but it is, um, it's an outcome that I have not only seen in these documentaries, but I've seen because I have worked with perpetrators in my practice over and seen the process in which they may be able to tell me and recount something that they did, that they even know, because, you know, they're walking around there, you know, they're very functional. They were, I mean, they may be able to tell me what they did, but they can't feel it. Uh, I had one come to me. What happened was he's a mature man functioning very, very well. He gets a call from his daughter that his daughter was raped in college. He, why did he come? He came because he was her father and he couldn't feel anything. And that he was horrified that he couldn't feel anything. Why can't he feel like just a natural rage and a natural urge to take care of his daughter and make her safe and hold her? And in that process of asking that question, his history of deadened victim, you know, split off unresponded to victim states and other things that he had done as a perpetrator that he always knew and felt very badly about Oh, in a certain sense, he felt a kind of superficial, it was more like shame. Like he didn't want anybody to know. It was a big secret, but he didn't get to reparative remorse. So in the process of questioning why he's dead inside about his daughter, he starts to consider, did he rape anybody? Did he passively ignore it? You know, he was an athlete in college because it was so prevalent raping women when they were drunk. And he didn't do anything about it. He knew about it. He didn't think he'd done it, but his buddies did it. He was in the house when it was going on. He heard a woman crying. He didn't do anything to save her. Um, all of this can start moving so that there's not only a responsiveness to the person and an accountability, but an inner um, compassion and concern and links made about, oh, that's why I did this. And it's not an excuse. I mean, in restorative justice practices, it's not an excuse. It's, and what's interesting is it's, since it's not a punishment model, but it is an accountability model, there is something about being held accountable that really can start to open this up. And sometimes what happens for real victims is that being in the presence of the perpetrator's genuine remorse 
um, with no excuses, that can be uh, healing. Um, not, you know, that's probably the more rare experience because their restorative justice practices don't that often necessarily have a direct encounter between the victim and the perpetrator. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Those are the kinds of things I've been thinking about. Um, so when I, as much as I hate this performance of white grievance, and it drives me crazy, I think as someone who is really trying to go deep into the psychology and heritage and history of how do we get here? Um, so, so Muki, um, turning it over to you for now, your thoughts, your questions. And Muki has been uh, studying these things from a very different vantage point, um, which Thank can you. come in. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sue. And I mean, this framework of white grievance, both from the perpetrator and victim side, Thank you for taking us both through our forgotten history as a nation, whether you were born into it, quote unquote. Um, as one of our lecturers uh, last week talked about, uh, Dr. Miriam Jernigan Noesi talked about racialized trauma actually, and how we kind of land in the middle of, quote unquote, it already being in the water, yes. um, right? In the very systems that we, uh, kind of take. So from taking us from that perspective and then into the, the clinical perspective as well of what happens, right, in real time, sometimes even with yeah. a parent and child relationship who they're so surprised they can't even feel that empathy. empathy. Right. Um, so yeah, I'd love to give kind of three thoughts and if they're generative, yes, please feel free to, to pick them up. And then it looks like we're also getting uh, a lot of questions from the audience. They're very curious from, from this topic as well. So one of the things that you have me thinking about, um, Sue, is so the first point will be kind of on the point of memory. And I'll be looping in a philosopher yes. by the name yes. of Briggs. Yeah, that's right. So um, I'm going to get a lot of references from you after this. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Sue. Uh, this is one of the wonderful things about these dialogues. Um, yes, so Bergson talks about an interesting way of being in the world. And he uh, was dialoguing in a time where time was very much on the mind of people. He dialogued with Einstein, who pushed us to, mm -hmm. away from Newtonian time towards thinking of time as relative, so maybe more bendy. But Bergson had an interesting thing about time as duration or duty in French. Sorry for the people who could actually speak French. I apologize <laughs> for butchering that word. <laughs> but for Bergson, it's the idea that time, at least in the subjective psychic state experience, is a duration of experiences. So he opens it up to an understanding that there is not an objective time a kind of a subjective movement of different psychic states throughout our lived experiences. The interesting thing about this framework is in his first book, In Being in Time, he talks about duration a lot, but in his second book, Matter and Memory, actually hones into the fact that when we talk about the past, it's not as if, you know, in the colloquial sense, oh, it happened in the past. Like, mm -hmm. it's over there, it's done. Right. For <laughs> For Bergson, the idea is that memory always continues to interpenetrate into the present, right? Whether conscious or unconscious. And sometimes as we experience as clinicians and practitioners, what happens when some of those memories are traumatized? So that is uh, a point that I'd love uh, to explore more. Another one as well um, is the idea of how we encode memory um, through our neurochemistry. Yeah. In a previous week, we also had um, Dr. Robert Sapolsky, and he talked about stress and how we actually embody stress uh, from the fullness of our embodiment, from the 10th cranial vagus nerve and our HPA axis and all, all those things. But um, a lot of people forget that uh, the amygdala and the hippocampus 
the amygdala being very known for its uh, kind of connections with emotion and the hippocampus with its connection to memory is actually in the same system. So what that means is at times when things are super loaded with emotion, um, they become encoded or unencoded uh, depending on the salience of them. And we can begin to think of what happens, right, when we pair these things uh, in terms of victimization, traumatization, and perpetration. So yeah, I'll just leave those two things and I'll oh, save the third one for another time. I mean, because, um, you know, trauma theory very much sounds like this model of, of um, time that you're talking about, that it's, it's never passed. I mean, let's also understand that um, some of these conditions are perpetual, so you can't put it in the past, right? Like the iterations of the way African-Americans have been treated in this country, they can never land on, okay, that, you know, slavery, you know, like people talk about, oh, slavery was over a hundred years ago, can't you let it go? Well, gee, there was this, you know, there was convict labor and Jim Crow and lynching and, right, but, <clears throat> but even if there isn't, even if it seems like the events are past, that, that memory is this elastic, ongoing um, thing. And also what you said about the amygdala, when you said about the emotion in the amygdala, I absolutely flashed on what I saw on the siege on the Capitol. The raging, like, violent aggression that is just, um, you know, looks like, I mean, it's terrifying. And what is that about? So yeah, that physiology is also really important. I just wanna add something that I also didn't say, which is that, um, and that's a whole other conversation, but successive waves of immigrants mm -hmm. um, were labeled non-white and had to become white if they had any hope of gaining the resources of living in this country. And becoming white always means splitting off an from other. Heritage. That's right. It means splitting off from your heritage. It means becoming shamed of your heritage in many ways, right? Because you don't speak English, you have different culture, you, you're different. But also, it also always means if you're struggling to acquire whiteness as an immigrant, it means that you have to somehow embrace, you know, racism. Because mm. you're going to have whiteness. You, I mean, obviously, some people remain very aware that they've been persecuted and they are caring for the persecuted people that they encounter here. But the general picture is of becoming white by uh, allying themselves with racism mm. so that they can have whiteness. So anyway, I know we have a lot of questions. Yes, yes. no, thank you. This is so so generative and I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing this dialogue. Yeah, um, we have a, a question from uh, the crowd. It reads, uh, in regard to restorative justice and the aspect of incorporating voices of victims how do we, one, be appropriately sensitive to trauma and vicarious trauma in incorporating this, including aspects of the trauma memory? Right. And then two, deal with biases of incorporating victims into the impact of the offender sentences. Yes. Um, right, right. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I wanna be really clear. I am just becoming educated about restorative justice practices. So anything I'm going to say is just my impression. Um, but you know, the restorative justice practice, it's from what I understand, it's a long, slow um, building of having someone who is an expert at doing this, who is very, very careful about the um, victims wounds and needs and states and what they're ready for, what they want. That's the whole point, right? Nothing is imposed. Nothing is rushed. Um, the whole thing is about how they're feeling, what they need, which can change next week or tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? Um, so 
uh, from what I'm reading, it's a very sensitive, uh, beautiful thing. And as I said, it's never rushed. It's not like something you set up, you're gonna have an intervention next week, and then mm. you're done. The, but the other thing, I'm not sure quite, but if this is answering the other question, but what one of the things that there's been criticism about is that um, any uh, regard for healing the perpetrator or, or uh, talking that language, or having that vision, um, it's problematic, right? Because the whole point of restorative justice is it's completely victim-centered. It's not perpetrator-centered. If the perpetrator gains growth out of it, then um, they can be facilitated to work on themselves somewhere else. But it, so that, that is a tension that, mm -hmm. uh, that I think exists in that area. Yeah. And I mean, even hearing you kind of grapple with the, the tension and the nuances, like you said, of kind of the patience and the slowness that has to happen from this, and also kind of the focus on the victim model, and then what do we do with the perpetrator? Um, it reminds me of the work of Greg Boyle uh, in Los Angeles, who works in a place called Homeboy Industries. And yeah. uh, the idea is to take uh, ex-gang members and to allow them uh, to kind of engage back in society. But I can see, right, kind of um, the tension therein and how do we treat in the humanist, both the perpetrator and the victim. Right, and I think one of the things is there needs to be different people holding each, you know, that um, mm. can't, if you have a victim in the, in the space of restorative practices, then it has to focus on the victim. You might be able to, you could have a perpetrator group, you could have a gang group where that's being worked through. There's a beautiful documentary also called The Work, mm. just a mm. beautiful um, process with uh, violent incarcerated criminals. And it's just working with the perpetrator and it's incredible. Mm. Um, but, but those things have to be handled with great sensitivity. Yeah. And um, another question is, uh, is repentance in some form necessary for healing from intergenerational trauma? Well, I think that, you know how hard it is to own victim states. It's incredibly hard to own perpetrator that we hurt somebody really badly. And, mm -hmm. uh, or, and or even that we are implicated, like we're implicated in whiteness, they are implicated in the whole racial regi regime here. Mm -hmm. I think for any time we have transgressed, and we're not talking about necessarily anything big, some form of acknowledgement that we've hurt somebody and that we can see their wound, not focus on a, a, what, you know, how guilty or upset or depressed I got afterwards, mm -hmm. but their wound. Uh, I think that that's part of human life and mental health and healthy relationships. So uh, I certainly think that for anybody who's really done some something really hurtful, yes. Um, and I just want to also underline, there's no emphasis on the victim's forgiveness. This is not mm. about the victim having to get to forgiveness. Mm. Um, in this practice or in the kind of therapy that works with this. Yeah, and I wanna be mindful of our, our time. So yeah. Sue, I will be giving some thank yous first and then I'll, I'll give you the, the final floor uh, for a couple minutes of if you want us to kind of grapple with, with anything. But thank you so much, Sue, this has been very fruitful conversation. Uh, if we had more time, I'd love to even ask you further, right, in terms of the idea of empathy that is being brought up. Um, I, I believe uh, Edith Stein wrote on the problem of empathy and that idea of empathy as being able to feel in through 
another person. And as, you know, depending on as fraught as it is in our understanding of transference and counter-transference uh, or even relating inner subjectively to the other in front of me, um, at least for Levinas, the idea that the other suffering must take precedence. Uh, and how do we navigate that when people are enacting these victim perpetrator states, not only in our clinical setting, but as you open this up to a society and a structure that we all kind of function in. Right. right? So thank you so much for prompting us. Mm -hmm. It's so difficult. And one, one important aspect of empathy is recognizing the other. It doesn't always just mean soft, gentle, oh, I understand how you feel. It means seeing the other. So for example, when I work with perpetrators, for example, this man who couldn't feel for his daughter, when he actually told me some of the things that he had done, and I liked him very much, and I cared about him, and I could see the hurt, right? But when he told me some of the things he'd done, I said, you did some really bad things. Mm. And that was really awakening. He'd had a, a therapist before, an analyst, who also he had told some of these things. And the mm. analyst never said that. Wow. Never said, this was a very bad thing you did. And saying that really reduced his dissociation. And he mm -hmm. embarked on a long, slow period of, of recognition and um, how was he going to make amends for these things that he had done? Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of commitments was he gonna make in his life? So, I mean, it was awesome. It was one of the most moving things I've ever been through, but empathy involves recognition and accountability. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when I look at the way white, white grievance is functioning in this country, I wanna lock them all up, right? But I know that there needs to be some combination hmm. like we're talking about where perpetrator parts are held accountable but enough like this gang work to where also victim states and sorrow for make, about making amends and also hmm. capacity to have pain, one's pain. I don't know how we do that. And I, I guess one of the things I just want to end with, which I love, is I love Brian Stevenson. And he said, we're all more than the worst thing we've ever done. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we think well, of our own transgressions, uh, it helps to hold on to that. So thank you. That is a very powerful note. Everybody remembers that. We're all more than the worst thing we've ever done. And it looks like with that, we are out of time for our lecture tonight. Um, this event would not have been possible without the entire work of the village. So is it okay, Sue, if I just thank them? Yes, and I wanna thank everybody who, I had, I had Zoom parents <laughs> who knew what they were doing with the technology and helped me and made me feel like super calm about doing this. And of course, David and you and. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, as, as Sue is echoing, I'd like to thank uh, my co-director and dear friend, uh, Associate Dean David Goodman for his tireless effort to direct psychology towards questions and practices of ethics towards the other. Uh, additionally, I'd like to thank uh, those in the professional and continuing education department uh, including the fantastic Zoom room parents yes. uh, that Sue was mentioning, uh, Lillian and Mo, who allowed this uh, to be brought to y'all in the audience, and to our fearless director, uh, Ashana Hurd, and her many collaborators across Boston College. To each of y'all in the audience, most importantly, to you, Sue. Thank you so much. And thank you to you all in the audience. I'm sorry I didn't get to more of your questions. I wish we had hours to talk and that I could see you while we were talking. Okay, thank you, Mookie. Of course, y'all. We hope to see y'all 
In the next Psychological Humanities and Ethics Lecture, next week, we will be diving into LaPlange with Keila Ashdor. And the following week, we will be talking about immigration, practical theology, and the psychological experiences of community with Professor Hoffsman Ospino. We hope to dialogue with y'all again in due time.